When our senior pastor, Stan Copeland, introduced the Reverend Dr. Ron Henderson to us yesterday, Stan revealed to us his self-consciousness about being near one who is known to be among the most well-dressed in our North Texas Annual Conference. <laughs> Knowing that I would be introducing Ron today, I began to feel self-conscious too, considering if the suit I'm saving for Easter Sunday would need to be worn today. Then I heard Ron say in response to Stan that he was trying to take a break from that well-dressed perception. So today, I'm helping Ron break that perception. <laughs> the suit can wait till Easter. Yesterday, we heard Reverend Dr. Ron Henderson share how a train ride in the rain from a downtown Dallas station to Plano gave flesh to his pursuit of devotion and service, saying that there cannot be spirituality without action. Growing up in Waco, Texas, Ron had equated Christianity with going to church on Sundays and being morally good during the week. And looking back at that time as a lot of spirituality without much action, it was an insufficient, inadequate Christian spirituality. Upon boarding that Plano-bound dart train, Ron and his wife, Sandre, noticed in the forward part of the car a human being who appeared to be and smelled to be unhoused, unwashed, and unawake. That ride became a confession for Ron that in his striving for communion and union with God, he could not ignore the call to identify with the crucified Christ taking shape before him in this unwashed human being. Disfigurement, suffering, crucifixion is not attractive, and we are prone to turn away. Ron convicted himself of having the same reaction on that train. As Ron revealed to us his interior conversation with God and his exterior conversation with Sandre about the unhoused, unwashed, and unawake rider, it seemed that God awakened Ron with an extra train stop on that Dallas area rapid transit ride. For it was at Victory Station where Ron and his wife had exited to attend an event at the American Airlines Center, about one stop shy of Union Station. And when it was time to go home, the dart line they took did not include that stop at Union Station. But on that northbound train encounter with an unwashed human being shaping into the identification with the crucified Christ, God still gave Ron his Union Station stop. One could say that Ron's spiritual ride from Christ Easter Victory Station would not be complete without there being a stop at God's spiritual union station, that junction of devotion and service where spirituality unites with action. Or another way of saying it, and the way you've inspired me, Ron, is that when we identify with the crucified Christ, our devotion gains locomotion. And when our locomotion has devotion, then our ride becomes purified. <laughs> Today, Ron will speak to us about balancing idealism and realism to overcome a one-sided religion. You're still trying to get over Waco, aren't you? Yeah. So may we all get on God's Holy Spirit train 
with a warm lover's lane welcome. Ron, would you come up and call us all aboard? Wow, thank you. That was um, um, not an amazing introduction of me, but uh, just an amazing uh, summary of um, how God is working in our lives. And I enjoyed listening to you and, and you taking some of the things I uh, tried to say yesterday and putting them in your own wonderful, uh, splendid personality. Um, you know, we, 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 what make preaching come alive uh, is personality. And I, I tell you, you did a tremendous job. Thank you. I was inspired listening to you. Well, good afternoon. Um, delighted to be here again, <clears throat> trying to calm down after traffic and all of that. But it's good to be here. I, I have to tell you uh, a, a, an experience that is... is uh, funny to me, um, but it also says I wasn't very sharp in my thinking. Um, I, after Stan invited me to uh, be your preacher, a lecturer for the Owing Lecturers, I couldn't wait to tell one of my colleagues who is here today, Reverend Owen Ross and his beautiful wife, I couldn't wait to tell Owen that uh, I had been invited to do the Owings Lectures and uh, Owen's, uh, is, is Owen's first name, but I'm thinking it's his last name. And I know his family goes to come here to Lover's Lane, so I'm thinking this is his family. So I, I can't wait to tell Owen, Owen, I'm, I'm doing the Owen lectures this year. And he just kind of looked at me kind of nonchalant. <laughs> and I got to think, well, maybe he thinks I'm not worthy to uh, for this occasion. And then yesterday, I had the privilege of meeting David Owen, one of the grandsons of the family who unwrote this, and then it occurred to me, oh, Owen's last name is Ross. <laughs> oh, that, that was uh, hilarious to me, so I had to go up and, and tell him, I'm still glad I invited you, <laughs> and still glad you all came. And a, a joy uh, to have you here, uh, with our colleagues Stan and I think you all probably know Owen. Uh, he's got to be one of the hardest working people, minister, that I've ever known in my life. And uh, I think he, as I tried to talk yesterday about the intersection of spirituality and action that, and compassion that is already toward others, uh, I said yesterday, your, your pastor embodies that very well, and Reverend Owen Ross does also. So. Good to see you. <clears throat> uh, today we've heard the text from uh, Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 38 through uh, 42. And the title that I've, I've chosen today is uh, looked at balancing idealism and realism. And as we've been looking at identifying in this Lenten season with the crucified Christ, uh, my title for today is Identifying with the Crucified Christ, Overcoming One-Sided Religion. Now, before I go into, uh, go deeper, I'd like to say to you, as we shared uh, some of us yesterday at lunch, uh, I see myself, I understand myself, and I'm probably understood by many of my colleagues at least that's what they, they've said to me also, that I see myself as an orthodox Christian. And when I say an orthodox Christian, that is that I, I believe and I embrace basic traditional Christian doctrine that the church has taught for more than 2,000 years. But as I see myself as an orthodox Christian, I like to think of myself as orthodoxy without judgment. And I probably gave that, those remarks to you to preface what's coming because over the last 10 years, uh, I have uh, practiced meditation as brought to America by Paramahansa Yogananda. 
who brought the technique of meditation to America from India in 1929. And so as I practice a spiritual discipline uh, from uh, the country of India, I guess I'm affirming not only my, my a strong commitment to Christianity, uh, but that uh, I'm an orthodox Christian. So even though there are techniques to the spiritual discipline of meditation, the leaders and the gurus of India are very clear and certain that the techniques themselves will not lead one to God, the techniques of meditation, nor even meditation by itself but it is technique plus devotion. And it's amazing, uh, in India, they have this great affirmation of Christianity because they, they, they tell the, the, tr the tradition in India uh, how meditation got started there is that Jesus uh, Christ uh, gave the technique to uh, meditation to one of the gurus, Malaha, uh, Baba, Bhavagan, not Bhavagan Christian, but uh, a person called Bobby G. And he gave it to Bobby G because Jesus said to him <clears throat> that Christians had gotten so involved and busy doing so many other things that they forgot about their commitment and their devotion to God. And meditation is a way of getting back to God's through meditation. So I kind of give some uh, uh, clarity as we look at our text today of, of Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary, as you know, were intimate friends of Jesus. And one of the most known places in the Bible, in John's Gospel, we get a clear understanding of how this friendship, uh, this union uh, between Martha and Mary and her brother Lazarus as we know the story in John the 11th chapter, uh, how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The text in John Gospel says that, and it's important for this text, that Jesus uh, loved Martha, and Jesus loved her sister, Mary, and Jesus also loved Lazarus. And so as we look at Martha and Mary, there is a, an intimate, close relationship with Jesus and there is a close relationship with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and their family. Now let's look at, the, let's look at these sisters. I want you to get an understanding of them. Martha is a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. She loves Jesus, and Jesus loves her. How do I know? In John the 11th chapter, when Jesus finally made his way to Bethany, the text says Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. So Martha is a Christian. Martha loves Jesus, and Jesus loved Martha. Getting an understanding of Martha, Martha is an idealist. She does not look at things as they are, but she look at things as they can be. Martha's always busy trying to change things, always busy trying to make things better for everyone. Remember in John's gospel, uh, she told Jesus after he arrived there late, late so after Lazarus was dead, if you would have been here, so she doesn't look at things as they are, but as they could be. Had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know even now, whatever you ask of God, God would do it. Martha is an idealist. <clears throat> you need to understand that. She does not look at things as they are, even Lazarus' death, but she look at them as they can be. Now, if Martha was here today, and I know you're here, Martha. If Martha was here today, Martha uh, would probably today be in Baltimore or on her way to Baltimore 
to console families of those who've lost members yesterday or help any way she could. And Martha would probably be turned around and chastise the ship ca captain for not being more careful. If Martha was here today, and I know she's here, she would probably be on her way to Baltimore or already there. If Martha was here today, and I know she's here, Martha would use her time, spend her time, her energy and her money uh, assisting immigrants, grants. And it wouldn't matter to Martha if they were legal or illegal. She, all she would see in them is the sacred humanity. And she would want for them the future that God wants for them. And she would want for them the same future that she wants for her family. She's an idealist. She does not look at things as they are, but she look at things as they can be. If Martha was here, she would reach out, no doubt about it, to the LBGT community and let them know that there is a place for them in the United Methodist Church. And not only that there is a place for them in the United Methodist Church, but there is a seat at the table where visions and dreams are born and decisions are made. Martha, I know you're here, but you hold on. I'll be back to you later. <clears throat> now Mary, and I know Mary's here also. I know you're here, Gary. Martha is an idealist, but Mary is a realist. Mary look at things just as they are, and she accepts that. Uh, and Mary, too, is a Christian. Jesus loved Mary, and Mary was always worshiping Jesus. If Mary was here today, and I know she's here, she would be at the Lenten lectures today. She would have been at the organ recital on Monday, and she would be at Handel's Messiah on Friday. Mary is a realist. <clears throat> Mary would accept the events in the United Methodist Church in America, <clears throat> and nothing would stop her from worshiping God. God, Mary, I know you here, but Mary, you hold on. <clears throat> I have a word for you. <clears throat> Martha is an idealist, uh, uh, but the problem with Martha is Martha has to overcome one-sided religion. <clears throat> you with me? You see, Martha is involved in several ministries, if she was here, she'd be involved at several ministries at Lover's Lane. But sometimes Martha would get so busy, and she does, uh, that she'd be too tired, too weary to go to worship, a Bible study. She'll go on a mission trip, but she'll stay home Sunday to rest her weary body. Are you getting this about Martha, this, this, this idealist? I, I told you the other day, the homeless man, homeless guy, human being that I saw on that train and that I didn't intervene and it hunted me, if Martha would have been on that train with me and if Martha would have seen that human being, Martha would have gotten him a place to stay that night. Uh, she, she, would, she, she would have got him a place to start, stay that night, but Martha wouldn't bring him to worship or to the lectures, nor would she introduce him to Jesus. You see, Martha is so busy, busy working for God, but Martha does not take care of the inner spirit of her soul. So she, every time something happens to this idealist, because she's so busy trying to do so many things, and then you, she just gets bent out of shape just a little bit. She gets irritated, easily upset, lose her cool and calm. Are you hearing this now? Martha does not take care of her inner counsel. So she not only, as we saw in John's gospel, 
blame Jesus for, uh, for being late uh, at, at Lazarus' death, or even in this text, she not only blames Jesus, but she also gets mad at Mary. Are y'all getting this picture of Martha now? Uh, she's so busy that, and, and not fully feeding her soul that she easily irritated and get anxious and gets upset. And then she, gets, she blames Jesus and she gets mad at everybody else at the church for letting her do everything by yourself. You see, Martha, you get so busy, 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 busy that you forget about the important relationship between God and yourself, and not only the relationship between God and her, but she also forgot about the relationship between herself and her sister and her brother. Martha, you get so busy and so worried about everything in life, you forget about your relationship with Jesus. You work more on doing things than you do on relationships. Hmm. Uh, to the Martha crowd, <clears throat> to the Martha crowd, if, if Martha was on uh, an airplane flight going somewhere, and uh, the flight attendants or the captain came on and say, in case there is a drop in cabin pressure, uh, put the mask on yourself first, and then use the, uh, take the mask and assist whoever needs help. help. But if it was Martha, Martha would put the, the mask on her companion first and overlook herself. That's the Martha crowd. Now here's, here's so you get the picture of this idealist? Now here's Mary. <clears throat> Mary is a realist. Mary gets all dressed up for worship. She's got her Bible in her hand. Mary got her hymn book in her hand. And Mary can't wait to get the lovers lane, to worship God, and to shout, and have a good time. And so she's gotten up early to go to worship, and she's dressed up, and she's got a hymn book, and she has her Bible. But the problem with Mary on her way to worship God, she knows that the folks next door don't have food to eat. Uh, but she's going on anyway because she got Jesus. Did I tell you that Mary, that if Mary was on that train, I told you what Martha would have done. If Mary was on that train and she saw that homeless man, uh, uh, but she would have stayed in a hurry to get the lover's lane. I mean to worship wherever she was going. Mary isn't going to march or protest at anybody's rally. Those people, she said, better get themselves some Jesus. And if Mary was on that airplane flight and the pilot or the flight attendants came on and said, in case there's a drop in cabin pressure, put the mask on yourself first and then assist your companion who may need help. Mary would put that mask on herself and God help the companion. The problem is both Martha and Mary are Christians and followers of Jesus, but both Martha and Mary need to overcome one-sided religion. That's all I was trying to say yesterday, that this Lenten season is our time to take care of our inner life, our devotion, our spirituality with God, and then our outer life, our action, our generosity, and, and action that are oriented to other people. Uh, Martha uh, worked so hard, but she didn't pray. Now, we can like all that we see about Martha and Mary. That is good. But I want you to know something about Martha. I would say to her today, Martha, I know you're here. And this is what I want to say to Martha. Life happens. She always getting bent out of shape. Life happens. And I praise you for knowing that. Martha, you face life. But you know that Jesus told you in John the 8th chapter, the 12th verse, I am the light of the world. But then Jesus said to her and others on the Sermon on the Mount, 
he tells his listeners, you are the light of the world. In one place he says, I am the light of the world. But then he says to the listeners, you are the light of the world. Martha, I need you to hear this now. Because you are the light of the world in Christ. And the light of the world in, in, in us is the same light that's in Jesus Christ. Lent is our invitation. Lent is our season for the restoration of that light in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Martha, you are invited to restore the light of Christ in your own heart and in our hearts so that we can be of help to others because uh, the lamp that shines the light into the world, uh, it is impossible uh, if we don't uh, have that devotion. Martha, I would say to Martha also, there he is, an inexpressible joy in God. Martha gets filled up in doing, but I would say to Martha, in your prayer, in your fasting, in your meditation, in your Bible reading, in your communion and oneness with God, there is inexpressible joy. That's to the Martha crowd. Now Mary loved Jesus, but do you see he is still in Gethsemane today? Mary, I know you're here. I need you to hear this, Mary. Mary loved Jesus, but do you see Jesus is still in Gethsemane today? He is in Gethsemane today, and all those people who are crushed by fear, he's in Gethsemane today with all of the people who are crushed by shame or guilt. He is in Gethsemane today by all of those affected by the tragedies of the world that are caused by sin. When we see the immigrants and we say no to them, that's Jesus in Gethsemane carrying that burden. Mary... Christ is yet today under a heavy load of the cross for those who have fallen under the load of debt, a loneliness, a shame, a hardship, a temptation. Mary, the life of Christ is a template for the entire human experience. If you suffer, you are one with Christ in Gethsemane. If you are filled with bliss and radiant joy, you are one with Christ on the Mount of Transf Mount Transformation. If we die or experience any kind of life-changing transition, the crucified Christ accompanies us. And when new life rushes in, in to transform us and enlighten us, we are one with the crucified God, we are one with the Spirit. <clears throat> Mary, I need you to hear this. You have voice. Mary, with your holy self, the Holy Spirit is in you. You have Holy Spirit power. You have conviction. And Mary, I come to tell you today, you need to use your voice and use your power. <clears throat> Lift up your voice and speak against racism. Lift up your voice and speak against sexism. Lift up your voice and speak against homophobia. Sp lift up your voice and, and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Use your voice and your power to help those who are in need. Let us all be one with the crucified Christ. To all of us, life happens. Martha and Mary knows that. <clears throat> And so life happens, and when life happens, we do life. We don't quit, we don't run out, we just do life. I, 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 I learned something about life some time ago, you all. It's, it was a good theological lesson for me, and I got it from, of all people, a Kardashian. Cleo <laughs> got a good theological lesson. Uh, Cleo Kardashian used to be married to Lamar Odom. L Lamar Odom was a uh, power forward for the Los Angeles Lakers and played on several of their championship teams. And Chloe and Lamar uh, were married. And then Lamar got hooked on cocaine and his life was torn asunder. And Chloe and Lamar got a divorce. And then someone asked uh, Chloe Kardashian what happened between she and Lamar. <coughs> 
I was waiting on her to throw him under the bus. And her answer was, life happens. And I thought, what a word. What a word for me. What a word in our action. What a word uh, for our spirituality. When life goes asunder, life happens. And then I heard another hip-hop mogul, Jay-Z. Y'all know Jay-Z, don't you? He's married to Beyonce. And he said, just do life, do life, do life, do life. Every day, get up and do life. Ah, Lent reminds me to do life. And every day to get up and do life. So as I come to a close, I want to say that if Lent is just about giving up chocolate or skipping uh, an evening glass of wine or fried foods, no wonder we forget about it as soon as Easter rolls around. But when we remember that Christ is in every aspect of life, then the disciplines of Lent, fasting, prayer, generosity, action already taught others, then Lent is more than a spiritual workout for six-week period. But instead, Lent, Lent becomes an invitation to an ever-expanding way of life that links spiritual practices, abundant living, and, and action oriented to others as one. Lent is less about what we sacrifice, uh, less about what we make a, a fuss over. Lent is about how we make space uh, and create space in our inner lives for divine blessings and abundant living. And so I came to say to both Martha and Mary, in the spirit of King Jesus, overcome one-sided religion. And let's create space this Lenten season for the living Christ to dwell in our lives. Amen.